Thank you very much, Barry, for that very kind introduction. And um, I'm not sure if uh, Diane should introduce herself now, or do we do that in sequence? Well, let me say hi to everybody, and thank you, Barry, um, for the introduction. And um, David is going to start with the speaking, and uh, if he falls asleep, we'll sort of make a noise to wake him up. But thanks, David. You want to go ahead? Just unmute myself. I think you can now hear me. Is that, uh, can everybody hear me? Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Barry. And um, I hope that uh, I'll be able to summarize this succinctly and explain what we're doing. Uh, it's, of course, got to do with COVID, as almost all interesting research has to do with at the moment. Um, and the concern was the uh, massive drive towards developing ventilators. And of course, uh, I was invited onto numerous projects uh, from various sources uh, in order to rapidly prototype and develop ventilators or to source ventilators because there was this projected need that uh, as the COVID epidemic takes hold, uh, we were going to need this massive uh, number of ventilators to cope with hypoxic patients. Now, to some extent, that has proven to be true in many countries, and uh, the burden on ICUs has been absolutely enormous uh, in many places, not all. Uh, but uh, one of the aspects that we wanted to look at, and that's really the, the substance of the project that I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, is the idea of bypassing ventilation and oxygenating the blood directly. Now, originally, the plan was to do this as an alternative to ventilators because it became self-evident that ventilators would, uh, the production of ventilators would take quite a while to ramp up and particularly vent quality ventilators that had all the performance characteristics that we needed for these patients. Uh, but um, it turns out that there's another good reason to do it and this only became evident a little later. And that is that it's now becoming evident that ventilators cause a lot of harm in these patients. Uh, not always, and there are many indications in, in which ventilators are useful and necessary, and they save patients' lives, but they also have the potential to cause harm, barrow trauma due to the high pressures, and uh, it, there's a thought that if one can get away without ventilation and maintain a level of oxygenation that's uh, uh, consistent with uh, reasonable organ function, then that's possibly a better way to go. And CPAP, uh, BiPAP valves, and also um, the use of high flow uh, nasal cannula oxygen are some of the techniques that are used at the moment. Uh, so what we're suggesting here is an alternative technique to oxygenating the blood. And in fact, that's already being done. It's called ECMO, and I would assume that most people listening to this talk will be familiar with ECMO, that's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, but the problem with ECMO is that, firstly, it's in short supply. Uh, ECMO is only available in advanced centers. Uh, there are limited numbers of ECMO machines. Uh, I, my understanding is that even in advanced uh, industrialized countries, uh, there are limitations to the number of ECMO facilities available. It involves substantial expertise, and it's also very costly. So what we thought is that perhaps we could repurpose kidney dialyzers. So the standard hollow fiber membrane dialyzers, uh, if we could repurpose those to oxygenate the blood, they are after all uh, membranes uh, and oxygen transfers across membranes, just like it does in ECMO. So they're very similar devices. They are not purpose-built for oxygenation, they're purpose-built for dialysis. So uh, that uh, is obviously one of the constraints that we need to uh, investigate. But we began to look at the, um, the idea of using these dialyzers. And we wanted to prototype this very rapidly. We wanted to investigate it very rapidly and see whether we could move towards clinical application. And we've managed to do this. Uh, Diane um, was one of the key people involved in this. There were others. There was Tondorama Tambo and Neil Stacey, uh, and a number of other people have joined the team subsequently. Uh, but those were the key people, and those three people um, were doing the research on the ground, because as you mentioned earlier, I'm about 11,000 kilometers away at the moment. So I had to um, uh, do my bit uh, remotely uh, via Zoom and Skype and email and all sorts of other uh, modalities. 
So that was one of the challenges, interestingly enough. And of course, a lot of people are working that way just because of the lockdown, so not only because of distance. Um, but we began with a, a very rapid set of experiments with water to see how much we could oxygenate water. And there were enormous challenges in doing this because only this started only days before the lockdown, the formal lockdown in March in South Africa. So we had to assemble the equipment very rapidly and we had to uh, get together the protocols and uh, put together a, a, a system in a laboratory where we could actually test the oxygenation. And there were limitations because water is, has a particular solubility for various gases, oxygen included. So there was a saturation point and we couldn't get beyond that. So the best we could do with that technique was to establish how fast the oxygen could transfer given the limitations of the substance we were dealing with, which was water. So we, we really wanted a substance like blood with hemoglobin in it that would snap up the oxygen and allow much greater driving forces because the partial pressures wouldn't be too low in the solution. But that wasn't possible initially. And we did our experiments and the results were actually quite pleasing. Um, as difficult as it was to do the experiments, and as I said, uh, uh, Tondi, Diane and Neil did a magnificent job of those. And uh, they came up with a set of results which showed us that, in fact, it looks feasible to do it with blood. And we wrote a preprint, which we published online, uh, it hasn't been peer reviewed yet, uh, discussing our results in the hope that some, and we actually expressed this hope in the paper that somebody would pick up on this, somebody who had the facilities and was able to actually do these experiments with blood and uh, take it a little bit further and see whether we should be progressing towards clinical studies. Um, thus far, to our knowledge, nobody's done this, but as the lockdown eased, it became feasible for us to attempt this, and we in fact did this. So we used blood bank blood. It, it recently expired, um, so uh, it, it, was a, it was very useful to have this blood available, and the South African National Blood Services were very helpful in providing this. Um, we had to get ethics approval, both from the blood bank and from the university, uh, which we did. And that was a challenge in its own right, although the both committees were uh, amazingly efficient and expedited our uh, assessments so that we could get an answer for them in, reason, in, in record time, actually. And uh, we were then able to commence with the blood experiments. So we did those. And it appears that we can achieve uh, oxygenation at a rate that's roughly 15, perhaps 20%. Oh, this is with the single dialyzer. We can achieve uh, oxygenation at about 15 or 20 percent of the rate required for a typical adult, which is usually um, the nominal figure that's often mentioned is that uh, an adult human uses about 250 mils of oxygen. That's mils at standard temperature and pressure per minute. So that's the metabolic consumption of oxygen. That figure is actually very variable and varies according to circumstances. Uh, but it's kind of our benchmark and that's what we're comparing to. And we can achieve, as I said, about 15 or 20% of that figure using a single dialyzer. So using two of them in parallel with, uh, and incidentally, we can only achieve 500 mils of flow per minute in these dialyzers. That's all they're rated for, which is very different from ECMO, which where they go to one, two, two and a half, three liters, sometimes even three and a half liters a minute. So it's really, that's the flow rate of blood is really one of our limitations. But uh, we realized quite quickly that if we use two of these dialyzers in parallel, we could get to 30, 35, possibly even 40% of the oxygen requirements. And that may be more than enough to save a large number of patients' lives, uh, depending on their circumstances and the degree of hypoxia that we're dealing with. So I think that really summarizes the key issues that we've been dealing with in this project. Um, perhaps it's a good time now to share a photograph of the experimental setup. Um, and I'm just about to share that now. Um, so uh, this was a photograph taken by, I think it was taken by Diane. And you'll see two dialyzers. So these are renal dialysis devices, hollow fiber devices. Um, these are both uh, low flux dialyzers. Uh, they are polysulfone membranes, which are hydrophobic, which is very important in this application. Um, and the dialyzer on the left has a grayish color, and that's because it's got deoxygenated blood flowing into it. And in fact, we're using it to deoxygenate the blood even further by using nitrogen flowing in the opposite direction through the dialyzer. Uh, in fact, we eventually abandoned this approach 
to a simpler approach of simply bubbling the nitrogen through the blood in a flask. But this was the first setup and it's, I think it's useful to demonstrate. And the second dial is on the right is much pinker and there's a good reason for that. It's because it's oxygenating the blood. And you can see the line going to the top of the dialyzer that's carrying deoxygenated blood, it's very dark. And you can see the line coming out the bottom of the dialyzer that's carrying the bright red oxygenated blood. So that is really the experimental setup. Uh, we used a standard roller pump to pump the blood at 500 mils a minute, which is the maximum that the dialyzer is rated for. And uh, as I said, we believe that this could uh, present an opportunity for clinical application under dire circumstances where ECMO is not available and the clinicians don't want to use the other modalities because of various risks and other constraints. So I think I've kind of summarized it. Uh, perhaps I could hand over to Diane to say a little bit more about the challenges um, on the experimental side, because I gather the talk tonight is really about innovation in the face of COVID, which obviously presents a lot of challenges. And uh, there were indeed a lot of challenges. So Diane, perhaps you could uh, add to that. Um, thank you, David. Um, yes, uh, I mean, when David first phoned me and, and asked me about the idea and said, you know, think we could test it. It was just before lockdown, as he said, most people were working from home. And I just thought, oh, my goodness, you know, I, this, you know and then you kind of think of the details, which was like, how on earth would we procure anything? Like if we're trying to get a cartridge, you know, the person would have to go on the vendor system. You'd need a BE certificate, a SARS clearance certificate. Uh, and I mean, by that stage, everything would be locked down. But um, we, I did realize, and we all realized this is actually, you know, could save lives. So we kind of made a plan. David got donations of a lot of the equipment, um, which saved us having to go through the procurement process, because if we'd had to do the procurement process, we wouldn't have got anywhere. Um, we had to go around hardware stores. Um, you know, with these problems, you know, these kinds of projects, one of the hardest things is plumbing, connecting things to other things, because, you know, it comes out the gas bottle at one diameter and it has to go into the cartridge at a different diameter. And you have a variety of fittings, none of which fit. So it was a lot of plumbing um, issues going to the hardware stores, kind of telling them, how do I get from this pipe to that one? And then coming up with a solution and coming to do it. Um, we had lots of tape. Um, David, you just want us to go to the picture again. Yes. If you can share your screen. If you see this cartridge on the left at the bottom, that's the nitrogen line coming in and you can see how we've tied it on with tape because we couldn't fit it on. So there was lots of tape and other assorted things keeping things together. It really was a, you know, fly by seat of your pants kind of thing trying to connect it up. Um, one of the things we had to do was measure the gas flow rate, and we didn't have the right size um, flow meters and so on in our system, in, in our stores, and of course we had, didn't have time to buy. So the way we measured gas flow rates, for example, was really Heath Robinson. We took a cylinder of water, um, turned it upside down in a bucket, and just bubbled the gas in there and sort of took, saw how long it took to fill up the cylinder. And so that's how the gas control, you know, flow rate was controlled. And, you know, it was very much... Um, what, you know, let's make a plan and figure out how it can work. Um, one of the issues we faced, which was quite different in a case like this, especially when we started working, uh, the first experiments, as David said, we were working on water and gas and, and air. Um, I mean, that's not at all a, a safety issue, really. Um, but, uh, but the problem was we didn't know if any one of us had COVID. And so we had to come up, before people had really thought about it, is how do we work in close proximity with each other and protect ourselves in case there's COVID. Um, we had, you know, some postgraduate students helped us and our technicians helped us. And we all had to come up, we were wearing cloth masks and face shields and gloves and, and I mean, and, and we were just working with water and, um, and air and, and, and or, or O2 in some cases. Um, so that was quite a, it, it, uh, quite a change as we sort of got dumped into this mask era very, very quickly because of this. Um, but it was, I, I must admit from my point of view, I haven't been in the years and I absolutely enjoyed it as did my colleagues Tondi and, and Neil. It was actually wonderful being in the lab, trying to sort these problems out. Um, we all had boxes of stuff from our tool sheds, just try and see what we could connect to whatever. Some of the fittings that are in, in that thing are garden from the garden irrigation systems and you know, it was really 
um, great fun. And then also to try and get the results out. Um, you know, the, the blood gas analyzer, as it would be, the one we were meant to use, didn't broke the day we were before we were going to start using it. You know, sod's law. Murphy, you know, they were all working with us and helping in their own way. Um, and then this took a call to Sydney. I think that's why David hasn't been sleeping because, I mean, we just phoned him whatever time. You know, David, what do we do? The blood gas analyzer is not working. Now what? And then he arranged for us to get to um, have access to the one in ICU. And so we were up in the, you know, medical school in the ICU wards wandering around with our samples. But the first experiments that we tried with the blood, the blood just clotted everywhere. And we just looked at this and we thought, there's no way we're going to be able to, or even, you know, we didn't think it was ethical to actually put these syringes, which might have small clots in, big clots in, I don't know, into the ICU blood gas analyzer in case we broke it. I don't know if they have filters in or what, but I didn't want to test. Um, but luckily, the, the, the blood gas analyzer that we were going to be using in the other lab came back online. And so it didn't hold us up too much. But um, yeah, it was great fun. We needed David a lot. Um, working with blood is quite different to my normal chemicals. And it was a great team, I must say. It was wonderful working with Neil and Tondi and David. And there was lots of problem solving and ways of trying to get things to work with the sort of box of tools we all had from our various houses. And uh, yeah. And, and what was actually, I think, most surprising of all, the mass transfer coefficient we organized, we, we, we measured on the original experiments with the water and air and oxygen actually came out to be almost identical to the ones that we measured with blood. So it was actually very nice that you could make predictions and it actually turned out they actually worked. And I suppose that was one of the nicest bits and it would be really great if this can be used and actually does save some lives. I think that is the aim of our research, I suppose, to make a difference. And let's hope uh, it can be taken further. 